Welcome to this act of worship at the United Church in Winchester. And welcome to so many faces that I'm seeing here in front of me now, faces that I haven't seen for some time. And welcome to those who are joining us uh, by the wonders of modern technology. As always, a huge thank you to our tech team for making that all happen. So welcome if you've been here for yeah, uh, a, a week or two before. And welcome back if you haven't been for a long time. I'm just going to say a little bit about kind of social distancing and masks and things like that. What I'm going to say is as numbers increase and confidence increases, we just ask that you continue to kind of show respect and care for everybody's different needs. Everybody's going to be at a different stage, uh, prepared to do um, some things or, or, or others. Just be mindful of where other people are. If you feel that uh, you can do, then please wear a mask as you're going around the building um, and, uh, and, 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 and moving around. And just giving people uh, space if you feel, um, if, if you need to. Our service will include the sacrament of Holy Communion and if you're joining us at home then please do have uh, bread and wine or suitable alternatives available uh, for that part of the service. And I hope that some of you will have brought refreshments with you for after the service, whether that's uh, a little packed lunch or a piece of cake or something. Um, because we encourage you to stay behind, again, only if you feel uh, able to do so, um, to share in a time of fellowship and hopefully catch up with people a little bit after the service. As we enter this time of worship, let's find space, let's find a bit of quiet to approach God in our own ways as we worship him. We join in saying our call to worship together as it appears on screen. We are God's people. How good it is that we have all come, women and men, young and old, to worship God who creates us. How good it is that we are gathered to meet Jesus Christ, God's living word. How good it is that we seek together signs of the Holy Spirit, whom we cannot catch or subdue. Come, let us worship God. And I invite you to stand if you are able to do so as we sing our first hymn together. Let us build a house where love can dwell. It's number 409 in the hymn book.
Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we praise and adore you as we gather for this time of worship today. With people near and far, with people joining us in so many different ways, we offer you our thanks and our praise that as a community of Christ, we can gather on this day. We ask, gracious God, that as we praise you this day, as we offer our praise through song and through prayer, through word, through scripture, and through sharing a meal, that you will bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, filling us, dwelling deep within us, that we may know your love in our lives and have a real hunger to share that love wherever we go. Loving God, forgiving God, we know that it's not been an easy 18 months. There have been many challenges that we've had to deal with, sometimes on our own, feeling isolated and alone. Sometimes we've made good choices and sometimes we've made not so good choices. All of these moments these lived realities we place before you now. We place them before you in our frailty and our brokenness. But we place them before you also in the knowledge that you can and do make us whole. So we ask, gracious God, as we come back together as a community, as we welcome this new connectional and academic year, that you will breathe new life into us, that you will show us new ways to be church together and new ways of sharing your gospel truth far and wide. Embolden us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's been a fairly crazy 18 months, hasn't it? That's probably the understatement of the century. And it would be wrong, I think, to have a welcome back service without offering the chance to look back and reflect on where we've been. There have been highs, there have been lows. I expect at times there have been more of the latter than the former. So what I want us to do now is just to pause and have a little bit of a time of reflection and possibly sharing if you feel able to do so where we're going to think of some of those, well, we're going to start with lows, finish on a high. We're going to start with lows. We're going to start by thinking of maybe something that's been a real struggle. It doesn't have to be the biggest struggle. It doesn't have to be anything that's massively personal. But think of something that's been a negative for you, something that's been difficult or hard, uh, or an occasion that was difficult or hard, um, that you've had to deal with throughout, shall we just call it, the pandemic so far. And if you feel able to share those, I'm going to come round in a moment and I'm going to ask you, don't worry, I will wear my mask. And then I'm going to turn that around. And I want you to think then of something positive, maybe something that you've learnt or something that you've been challenged by throughout this period of the pandemic. And I realise sometimes that may mean we have to dig deep into ourselves and think about what that might mean. But I do believe that sometimes through periods of challenge, we also find moments of hope 
are moments where Christ breaks through and gives us something really meaningful um, to work on. So I'm going to put my mask on now, and I'm going to take my lapel mic out. I think I'm, I'm switched on. I'll, I'll soon be told if I'm not. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Great. Okay. I'm going to actually take this off. Does anybody want to share a negative? Something you've struggled with? Spending Christmas Day on our own without the family. Oh, yes. Thank you, Pat. Spending Christmas Day on your own. Yes. And I mean, it, though we may have had Zoom to help us with some of those things, it just wasn't the same, was it? It wasn't the same. Yeah. Anyone else? Just put your hand up and I will get to you. I'm gonna, we'll make sure everybody that wants to say something has an opportunity to say something, okay? Even if this part takes half an hour and I shorten my already short sermon. I'm going to go on and on. No, no, not at all, Jan. <laughs> Hello, everybody, by the way. It's nice to see you. Um, I started back at work after 15 years, and um, that was a big thing in itself, but from the kitchen table, managing people I've never met. Yeah. Yeah, so not the face-to-face -face contact and everything that goes with it. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Who else? Susan. Um, my mother-in-law was in a home and uh, we couldn't see her for months and even when we could see her there were no appointments and it was very hard and then she died on Mother's Day so that was hard. Thank you for sharing that Susan, thank you. Eddie. Losing loads of my um, last year of primary school. Absolutely, all of those, that's supposed to be the big crescendo of primary school, isn't it? And it just didn't happen, did it? Thank you. Who else? Keep your hands up and I'll... Neil. Uh, for me, the sheer workload was one of the challenges. Um, there were some people who had too little to do in, in the pandemic and there were some people who had um, more than enough, let's say, yeah. and I was one of those. Absolutely, it's one of, one of those things, isn't it? it? We were all in the same storm, but very different boats, I think, is the way people are explaining it, aren't they? Yeah. Who else? Hilary. Um, my daughter was out of work for over a year, and she was in the east of London, and we couldn't see her all that time. I... Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Hilary. Anyone else? There we go, Nigel. Our whole family was worried because Abby, our daughter, was uh, on ITU, ITU physio. Yeah. So we were worried if we would ever see her again. Yeah. But gladly we did, of course. Yeah. She, she did a great deal of great work. Yeah. Absolutely. But at the time, you just didn't know. Didn't know. Yeah. Didn't know really right at the front line. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? I don't see any hands. Any more hands up? Thank you um, to those of you that spoke, and, and don't worry if you didn't. Um, thank you all for sharing those things or thinking about those things and making yourselves to an extent vulnerable and be, being prepared to be vulnerable in front of other people because I think sometimes that's really important that we can do that and we can share those things as a community. Now, positive. Dig deep. What are some of the positive things that you found about having to go through the pandemic? Because we had to spend so much time together, I learned to be much less irritating. <laughs> Steve? <laughs> I think we, uh, we probably need to offer prayers now for, for Steve and, and for Jane in particular. Absolutely. But something about, you know, working through um, being, you know, in, in, you know, in that situation where we're locked inside our houses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we spent a lot more time with our immediate neighbours all on our front gardens having a tea or whatever. And that was really nice sense yeah. of community. Yeah, so building back some of that kind of sense of community and sense of, you know, being in a, in a, in a street with people and seeing who are behind those front doors. Yeah, ah, that's, thank you. Robin, and then Pat. 
the way people came out and helped other people, yeah. re I found really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The way people came out and helped, you know, uh, you know, human kindness is still there and is still um, at work in our world, thanks be to God. Finding local walks I didn't know existed. <laughs> finding local walks, yeah. So finding things to do locally. Anybody else taken part in the great staycation? I was just amazed. So many people said how quickly the time passed, even though it was long. And, yeah. you know, that was amazing. And I also discovered jigsaw puzzles. Jigsaw puzzles. It's funny, the passage of time is a funny one, isn't it? I'm quite sure that time actually isn't a constant. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's a construct, it's a myth, and it kind of slows down and speeds up. I was going to say that I think a few of us found far more depth in ourselves that being stuck at home, I listened to the radio an awful lot more, I read an awful lot more, I thought an awful lot more, and I didn't think that I was so self-sufficient. Yeah. I'm thrilled to be back with everybody, but it taught me to be self-sufficient. Yeah. taught you to, to look deep in yourself and, and, and find those own personal resources to get through the time. Thank you, thank you. Last Christmas, because everything closed early, the streets and the town centres were much more quiet and peaceful than usual at that time of year, yes. which was rather nice. Thank you, Christine. So you didn't get the usual um, drunken kind of um, uh, hellos to you as you're putting up the Christmas lights and doing the decorations around the city. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Being more aware of um, the importance of the people around us who, who are special to us, yeah. and also that God's with us uh, in the the difficult times as well as the good times. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So being more aware of those who are particularly special to us and recognising God's presence in that time of adversity. Um, I think that's, yeah. Thank you for that, because I think that's the first contribution where God's featured, um, you know, and, and I'm sure that's been in all of your thoughts and contributions, but who else? Who else? Who else? A hand up. There, Ellie. Getting my work out. It's even, it's even more, I'm breathing a bit because of the mask, you know. So. It's made every time that you can be together with friends and family even more special. Yeah, yeah. It's really made you cherish those moments, has it? And, and think about how important they are. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Pauline. Our lovely wedding that we had here, which was so tiny, but it was so special. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. We had a lovely wedding, didn't we, here? It was a, all, all six people. All six people, but it was, an, it was a lovely, intimate and very meaningful service, wasn't it? Thanks be to God for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Steve. Uh, it's made us move forward on the technology front, uh, and it means that we can now take worship to people who can't come to church not only because of the pandemic, but people who couldn't come anyway for other reasons. Yeah. And we're so pleased that we've been able to help take worship to them. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, that's such a good point. Yeah. Wonderful. I don't see any other hands. Thank you so much for sharing those, those things that have been positives, those things that we've learnt. I'm going to, I'll turn this one off now, Christine, and go back to the lectern, Mike. Yes, thank you for sharing all of those things. So there have been highs and there have been lows. And one thing I want to draw from that and thinking about one of our Bible passages today is about the time when Jesus was criticised for, uh, for dining with sinners like tax collectors in that particular thing. And his response to that was, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. In other words, what I think Jesus was saying there was, those that are prepared to acknowledge their own brokenness, their own vulnerability, their own need for Jesus, are also the ones that Jesus wants to share a meal with. We've shared some of our brokenness today, and also some of those things that have helped to, to carry us through difficult times. And later in the service, 
we will all have a chance to sit at table with Jesus and share a simple meal with him. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing once again. This time it's number 92, if you're following in the hymn books. Think of a world without any flowers. And we will be singing uh, verses 1, 2, 6, 7 and 8. So the first two and the last three. And now we listen for the word of God in scripture, firstly from Mark chapter two, and then from Mark chapter eight. So the gospel of Mark chapter two, verses 13 to 17. Jesus went out again beside the lake the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. 
When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. In those days, when there was a great crowd without anything to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now for three days and had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come a great distance. His disciples replied, How can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them, gave them to his disciples to distribute. They distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish, and after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled, and they took up the broken pieces left, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. So there we have two short accounts from Mark's Gospel about Jesus eating with people. First, there's the account of Jesus uh, eating with, shall we call them those that others considered undesirable? And then they, were, they asked questions. I suppose it was you know, the, the great and the good, um, those uh, uh, well healed were saying, why is Jesus being with all uh, these other people, these, these people that um, you know, we consider to be um, uh, you know, sinners? Um, and Jesus responds, so actually, I want to be with these people who are broken, these people who are not afraid to show their vulnerability and who are not afraid to show their need for me. And then we have another group of people, a far larger group of people and a far larger meal. And again, it's another group of people who seem to have a need and a hunger for Jesus. And I just want to spend a few moments teasing out this, uh, this account, Mark's account of the feeding of the 4,000. So it's 4,000 here, there's 5,000 elsewhere, a great multitude. Anyway, it's a lot of people, okay, and they've all gathered to hear Jesus, and they've been there for three days. Just remember that. Because one of the questions I've always had about Mark's account of the feeding of the 4,000 is this, how on earth did Jesus keep a hungry crowd engaged with what he had to say for three whole days? Now, I'm sure I have your full attention at the moment, but if I was still preaching in 30 to 40 minutes, I'm sure a few of your minds would be starting to wander on what, onto what you had brought for your lunch. In truth, we're not, we've not even got to communion yet, and I'm already thinking about the sandwich that I'm going to tuck into afterwards. Now, of course, I'm sure they weren't all hungry right from the very start. Some of them will have brought provisions with them to this deserted location, perhaps enough even for a couple of days. But whatever the food situation was, it's clear that by the third day, it's pretty much all gone, and we're faced with a lot of hungry mouths. Yet still they are there. Still they are listening to Jesus. And they're not about to go until he sends them away. That's the sense I get from this. They are there, captivated by the word of Jesus. And he's thinking, crikey, I've got to send these people away. And some of them look as though they're about to drop. 
Although we hear about this miraculous act of feeding thousands of people with seven loaves and a few fish, I wonder if the real miracle was how such a multitude was so hungry for the word of God that it stayed their appetite for three long days. That for each of those days they hung on to Jesus' every last word. That they were amazed by his teaching that it was life-changing for, for them, that, it seems, they didn't want to leave, half-starved though they were. I guess I could be reading more into it than is necessary, but by now you'll know that I'm just as fascinated in what the Gospel accounts don't say as what they do. But whether I'm guilty of embellishing the context or not, it doesn't change the fact of Mark's account that a lot of hungry people continued to be ministered by Jesus. And it is Jesus, not them, that is the first to think of their physical well-being. And it begs a stark question for us now. Which are we more hungry for? The word of God or the food that will follow? And I realize it's not an either or, as though you have to choose one or the other, or at least I hope it's not an either or. It's clear from the passage that Jesus was tremendously concerned about the crowd's physical well-being and their need for physical food. God doesn't want us to starve ourselves, clearly, for the sake of the gospel. But neither does God want us to be spiritually starved. There are times when we all need to reevaluate our walk with Jesus and draw close to his word once again with a genuine hunger to be fed in ways which food never can. I pray that we as a community, like that crowd listening to Jesus, will truly hunger for God's word. We'll hang on Jesus' every last word. We'll forget, if but for a moment or two, the physical constraints that sometimes limit us and be filled anew by God's living word. I pray that in communion, a simple meal, we will find more than just bread and wine, but the realization of Christ's presence with us here and now. And if it is really that for us, then the food that comes after will be all the better for it. Amen. We're going to sing once again. It's number 167. Colours of day dawn into the mind. Light up the fire.
We come now to our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers of concern for the world and for one another. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for all that you have blessed us with. We give you thanks for the challenges that we've had to deal with. And we give you thanks for the hope that we've built on throughout the last 18 months. We thank you for the world in all its diversity, in all its wonder, in all its fragility. And we thank you that you love each and every one of us as part of this world. And we thank you for this church. We thank you for the love that we find here, the friendship which we can share, and the hope that we can call on. At the beginning of a new year, we ask, Lord, for your guidance and for your strength as we start once again with so many different things that we feel called to do as a church community. We give you thanks for all of those who work so hard to make what we do as church a reality. For those that work behind the scenes, like Val and Pepe and Alison Wood for polishing our communion silver and washing the linen, bright and fresh for a new year. We thank you for our coffee bar team and all the effort that has gone into the preparation of reopening tomorrow. For our toddler group and our coffee, coffee bar playtime team. For all the other groups that are meeting. For all those involved in the fabric and the finance and the administration of this place. We thank you for all those that contribute to our worship. For Tony, the stewards, the tech team. And we thank you for our church council and all that they have held and dealt with on our behalf. Lord, I just feel we have so much to be thankful for as a church community, though we face great challenges. Thank you for church. And give us strength in the days ahead to meet the challenges that we will face. Bind us together as your holy people, looking to serve the community and share your love, near and far. And as we think about the community and communities near and far, we think about your world in all its need. And in a few moments of quiet, we call to mind those situations or those people that are on our hearts, that are on our minds. Too many to mention, but they're known to us and known to you. We continue to pray for the situation in Afghanistan and for all those that are fleeing the country and for all those that are involved in helping them to resettle. We pray that we may do what we can to support that work.
We pray, too, for the situation in New Zealand, asking that you will bring your comfort and your care to those people affected by that attack. And we pray too for this city and for this church. All those we know and love who are struggling at this time, who are not able to share in a time of worship, those that are in hospital or unwell. Lord, we ask that you be with them in a very real way. Our prayers reach out to them. Lord, we're reminded from Scripture that when two or our three are gathered in your name, then those prayers are heard and answered. And sometimes they may be answered by what we do in response to those prayers. Strengthen us, embolden us, give us enthusiasm and hunger to see your world changed by your living word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to share in the Lord's Prayer now, and we're going to do it in a slightly different way than we have done before. We're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, and it's a version that can be found at number 762 if you would like to follow in the hymn books. Uh, The words will be on screen because it's not our usual version of the Lord's Prayer. I will lead the singing, and Tony will give a few bars of introduction. Jesus said to them, Whoever wants to be first 
must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace be with you. We say together, Eternal God, we come with these gifts to offer our sacrifice of praise and the service of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing once again, it's number 712. Put peace into each other's hands. Jesus was often a guest. He shared many meals with his friends and they long remembered his words at the table. Jesus ate and drank with all kinds of people and showed everyone the love of God. Wherever people met together, Jesus was glad to be welcomed and to be fed. Today, we are the guests of Jesus. He welcomes us, whoever we are and whatever we bring. And he will feed us at this his table. Old or young, rich or poor, joyful or in sorrow, Jesus invites us to share bread and wine with him.
to remember the story of his life and death and to celebrate his presence with us today. On the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with 12 of his disciples in an upstairs room in Jerusalem. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it. He gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Loving God, the world you made is beautiful and full of wonder. You made us with all your creatures and you love all that you have made. You gave us the words of your prophets, the stories of your people through the generations and the gathered wisdom of many years. You gave us Jesus, your son, who embraced us with your love. He told stories to change us all. He healed those in pain and brought to life those who had lost hope. He made friends with anyone who would listen and loved even his enemies. For these things he suffered. For these things he died. And he was raised from death and lives with you forever. You give us your Holy Spirit to teach and to strengthen us, to remind us of Jesus Christ and to make us one in him. Send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and wine and upon us, your people, that Christ may be with us and we may be made ready to live for you and to do what you ask of us today and every day to come. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the love of the Creator, one God to whom be glory and praise, now and forever. Amen. Some of you will have shared Holy Communion in the church since uh, the pandemic, and some of you won't, so I'm going to go through how it actually works. What you have is you, the bread and the wine will both be brought to you, okay, and we will eat and drink together. So don't eat and don't drink until I come to the front and I will bid and we will all eat and drink together. Now, the bread is served in little cups, okay? So take the bread and tip the bread into your palm and then somebody will come and collect the glass from you and that's so that we can serve the bread safely to people and then as I said once everybody has been served I will come to the front I will bid we will all eat together likewise with the wine but don't tip that into your hands okay hold on to it and then I will uh, again once everybody has been served I will bid we will all drink together. And again, those of you that are joining us online, if you've got your, your communion elements ready, when I bid, eat and drink at the same time of us because we are all one body gathered together. And then the cups will be collected uh, during the final hymn. The gifts of God for the people of God. Not because we must, but because we may.
life. The bread of 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 life. Bread of life. The 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 bread of life. Bread of life. Bread of life. Yeah. Put that one back. Put that one back. Yeah. Okay. The bread of life. Special Hillary, you get two for one. Bread of life. 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 The bread of life. This is the bread of life. It reminds us that Jesus' body was broken for us, that we might have new life in him. Take and eat in remembrance of him.
blessing. Cup of blessing. Cup of blessing. Cup of blessing. Cup of blessing. Blessing. Cup of 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 blessing. Blessing. The cup of blessing. Cup of blessing. This is the cup of blessing. It reminds us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that all may have a new relationship with God. Drink of it and be made whole. Let us praise the Lord by saying these words together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Most gracious God, we praise you for what you have given and for what you have promised us here. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you, and we ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom, and that our love may be your love, reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing in a moment, but just a reminder that those of you that want to join us downstairs for refreshments after the service are very welcome to do so, but please don't feel that you you have to, um, but hopefully some of you may have brought something to, to eat and to nibble on as we share in some fellowship together.
Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Number 465. Please stand if you are able as we sing this together. Jesus said, Go home to your friends and your families and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And so the blessing of God be upon you all, the one who loves you, the Christ who calls you, the Spirit who makes you holy, today and always. Amen. <clears throat>